Hello. So it's one o'clock in the morning on October 16th, 2018. Um, I'm a night person. So uh, I'm in the community room of my apartment complex right now. And you can see how elegant and beautiful it looks and comfortable it looks in here. I'm not going to say it's similar to an ocean liner because it's definitely not. Uh, but I decided to come in here and, and record my fourth Titanic video. And the reason why I'm recording my fourth Titanic video is because I actually had a dream um, about it. And I contemplated it and I thought about it. And I said, this is a video that has to be made because this question always seems to come up all the time. Um, race in Titanic um, always seems to come up. Now, a lot of people don't like to talk about racism in our society. A lot of people don't like to confront the racism that existed in the early 20th century. But as a person of color, a, a mixed person of color who has both um, black ancestry and European ancestry, it's something that I am faced with all the time. As a person who was on the Human Rights Commission in the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, and now on the Disability Commission in East Hampton, Massachusetts, it's something that I have to confront all the time. And unfortunately, in 2018, you know, we're still dealing with racism in our society. So how does race and racism affect transatlantic ocean liners? Well, the first thing I want to say is, and I want to get this out there because I did my own research on this. I asked uh, Ed Kamuna, the Titanic historian founder back in 2011, about this. Cunard and White Star Line did not have a racial segregation policy. Now, in 1979, Wade, Wade Craig David wrote a book uh, called Titanic, uh, The Death of a Dream. And in that book, he um, claims that black people or anybody that was considered to be black were prohibited from ocean liners such as Titanic. That is completely false because no historian has been able to come up with definite proof of a racial segregation policy that required Cunard and White Star liners, as well as the French and the German liners, to segregate or prohibit their passengers based on race. To understand the context of racial segregation, you have to understand that racial segregation, the separation of races, is, um, is a United States and South African phenomenon. European countries such as Ireland and Great Britain and French and Portugal did not segregate their citizens based on race. Yes, there was racism. Yes, there was at times racial violence. But the governments and the courts did not require segregation. It was not an institution like it was in the United States. And I, I, I go into, um, I, I think there are a couple of reasons why racial segregation was not a thing in Europe. One of the main reasons was that there wasn't a large population of black people or people of color in those European countries. So there wasn't necessarily a need from their perspective to segregate people based on race. There's always been a theory that I've had that the less people of color there are in a predominantly white area, the less white people feel threatened by those people of color they are. So that's one reason. Another reason is because British philosophy of equality and fairness under the law under the law sort of prohibited that. Another theory that I think is that it was a constitutional monarchy. So there are lots of reasons why there wasn't racial segregation. But the key thing that you have to understand is those countries, particularly Great Britain, didn't have a written constitution. Any decision about discrimination or race 
basically had to be decided by Parliament. When people of color went to the British courts and said, I'm being discriminated against, can you stop this form of discrimination from happening? The British court's attitude was just like, oh, you're being discriminated against? Oh, we're so sorry. There's nothing we can do about it. you got to wait for Parliament. So there was no explicit written right in British law that you were equal under the law. It was more of a philosophy. It was more based upon codified laws and regulations and charters and so forth. So I don't want to get sidetracked here, but getting back to racial segregation on ocean liners, there is evidence that there was no racial segregation on ocean liners. And in fact, I referred to an incident that happened to the famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass in 1845, where he took a Cunard liner to Ireland, to England, to do his abolitionist tour. And he was invited by the captain up to what they called the saloon uh, cabin. But it was actually a first-class cabin. It's actually a first-class uh, dining area. And he was invited by the captain to speak about abolition and its benefits. Well, he did that, and it erupted into this huge uh, fury of fistfights and arguments and shouting amongst the first-class passengers. And so he was over in England and Ireland for two years. He said he felt freer over there in a constitutional uh, monarchy as opposed to a democracy. Uh, the British people wanted him to stay. They were willing to pay for his freedom, but he had to go back to the United States to help the United States. And when he went to Liverpool in 1847, the Cunard agent, because of the incident that had happened in 1845, had said to him, we prefer that you take uh, your meals in your cabin. Don't mingle with the other passengers. Don't talk to the other passengers. Just stay in your cabin away from the other passengers uh, because of the 1845 incident and also because of his race. Well, he did that, and it got back to uh, the British, pre the British uh, media, the British press, and the newspapers. And they erupted in fury. This is according to the Transatlantic book by Stephen Fox. Um, that I had talked about in my previous, my second Titanic video. And the British press erupted in fury. They were furious and angry. How could you institute this peculiar institution into our shores? And the key thing that I want to point out is S Frederick Douglass was, I, my personal opinion is, I think Frederick Douglass' incident was secondary to the fact that Americans, particularly American passengers, had demanded and tried to institute this peculiar institution into British shores. And it got back to Samuel Kennard, and Samuel Kennard was a man of his time. He felt that slavery was immoral, and he felt that it was a moral wrong to enslave the Negro. But like any other white man at that time, he didn't think that the Negro was socially um, equal to white folks. And so he got back to Samuel Kennard. Samuel Kennard said, I'm very disappointed that this happened to Frederick Douglass. I'm, I'm disappointed in the circumstances in which it happened. But as long as I'm alive and as long as anything is connected to my name, this isn't going to happen again. And um, it was a promise that was kept, particularly with race. But unfortunately, it wasn't a promise that was kept based on religion. There are some, there is some evidence in some, in, 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 in history books, and particularly this, uh, transatlantic book that I referred to by Stephen Fox, that ocean liners at a time refused to, at one point, accept Jewish passengers. For example, because of their religion. They refused to even accept third class passengers. Uh, for example, a lot of these first ocean liners that were built, like Britannia and, uh, Great Eastern and the Great Western, they weren't necessarily designed for third-class passengers in the way in which Lusitania, Mauritania, and the Titanic and the Olympic were designed for all classes of people. So there, there were some instances of religious segregation, but none of this segregation was 
was codified um, in law. Now we come up to 1912 and we come up to Joseph LaRoche, who is, and I've done this myself, I've, I've referred to Joseph LaRoche as the only black passenger on Titanic. And as a person of color, I have a different perspective on what is and is it black. Um, but I am wrong in that regard. Um, and this is further evidence of the White Star Line uh, not imposing racial segregation. Um, now, Don Lynch said on Facebook, he said, well, the father of uh, his father-in-law had bought the tickets and given them to the family because the French line had made up some excuse about, oh, you know, we don't allow, you know, young children into the first class dining saloon. That was sort of uh, an excuse that they made. It could have been it could have been they didn't want they didn't approve of an interracial couple, especially in 1912. We're talking about an extremely racist, dogmatic violent time period for anybody who had dark skin in the Western world. And that's a fact that people don't like to admit to. And I think it's a fact that makes a lot of us uncomfortable, especially white white folks. It makes white folks uncomfortable because they feel like, oh, if we talk about racism, we talk about white privilege, and we talk about all this stuff, then it personally reflects on me. So it's a very uncomfortable topic, and it's something that's not really talked about in Titanic circles, and it's something that's very disappointing to me because there are lots of black folks and lots of people of color who are very much into Titanic and love Titanic as much as I do, but it's something that's not addressed and talked about. And I think if it was addressed and it was talked about, it would make people more comfortable in liking Titanic. Because when I was growing up as a kid, uh, you know, liking Titanic and being into Titanic was sort of like a taboo. A lot of people would just say, like, why are you into Titanic? You know, it was nothing but white folks on board. And there's evidence that there were poems written in the black communities of Harlem and um, Los Angeles and Boston and all these other predominantly black areas where they wrote poems making fun of the sinking of the Titanic. And I could understand that because it was a very racist time period and the perception was that black people were not allowed on ocean liners which we know it now today is not true. But that's sort of the attitude that a lot of people of color have is, oh, people of color are not allowed on these ocean liners anyway. It was nothing but a bunch of white folks that died. Why should we even bother to care? And I'm not saying that black people did not mourn and care. I'm saying that from the perspective of a black person, it's sort of complicated to to care about people who died in the middle of the North Atlantic where when you feel like you're not represented in that in that sort of uh, tragedy. So getting back to Joseph LaRoche, uh, this is further evidence that he was not um, segregated based upon his race. He had to leave France um, because he couldn't find a job in France. Very well-educated man, French engineer, uh, related to the, his uncle was the president of Haiti. Um, and he had to leave France to go back to France because I guess, you know, it was so much racism. And it was casual racism. It, it, you know, it was, it was excuses made based upon his, his race. So, you know, his father-in-law buys him this ticket. He boards the Titanic. The agents don't prohibit him based on race. He's on the Titanic like everybody else. He's actually a second-class passenger on the Titanic, which to me is further proof of uh, the White Star Line not being necessarily as racist as uh, the United the United States uh, steamship companies, you know, and he, you know, dies on the Titanic like everybody else equally. Uh, now, some people say, well, you know, he wouldn't have gotten into a lifeboat anyway because of the color of his skin. Well, let's think about that for example for a second. Benjamin Guggenheim and his Aid died on died on died on the Titanic, and now we know that his aide is his um, valet, um, Mr. Julio, um, was Northern African um, or from Northern Africa. Which actually, um, I'm gonna get into that a little bit in a minute about how I think Northern Af Northern African is not the same as Sub-Saharan African, but. Um, Benjamin Guggenheim, for example, was a very wealthy first-class passenger, and he died on the Titanic. 
John Jacob Astor was a very wealthy pageant, pageant. He was the wealthiest pageanter on the entire ocean liner. And, and he died. So with these first class men who were extremely wealthy and influential and part of the upper crust of Western society died in the Titanic. I would very much doubt that a, a second class passenger like Joseph LaRoche would have been allowed into a lifeboat over these people. And it's not even based upon race. It's based upon the class that you are. And the policy was women and children first and only, depending upon what side of the ship you were on. And that was enforced equally. It wasn't based upon whether you were a third class passenger or a first class passenger. It was women and children. And that was the, that was the order. And that was followed through. Um, now getting back to, um, Joseph LaRoche and the four people on the Titanic who are considered to be black. By 1912 standards, with the sole exception of Mr. Giulio, who may have passed for Italian or may have looked Italian, all of those people would be considered to be black by Western society um, because they had African ancestry. Joseph LaRoche's two daughters, even though their mother was French, they had a Haitian father who was of African descent, and they would be considered to be black. It all goes back to the one drop rule, um, and particularly in the United States, but I think also in the Western world, if you looked white and you passed for white, then you were treated as a white person. But keep in mind that if you were passing as white, you had to leave your whole black side of your family behind forever. You couldn't have any contact with them. You couldn't talk to them. You couldn't write them. You couldn't do anything with your black relatives because you were leaving that world and going into the white world. And if you were to talk to your black relatives, you would expose that you had a black in you and you would no longer be considered to be white. So with the sole exception of, uh, exception of the Italian, uh, and he could have possibly have been Italian. We don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know where he was born. He could have been half Italian and half Northern African. But aside from Mr. Julio, who probably could have passed for Italian, all the rest of the people that were the other three passengers on the Titanic, Joseph LaRoche and his two daughters, were in fact black and still would be considered to be black today because a lot of things haven't really changed much. You know, I, I'm a mixed person of color, uh, you know, you know, myself, and I'm definitely considered to be black by society. Um, I have ancestral roots that go back to the kings of Europe and the queens of Europe, for example. Um, you know, half of my family, the name Talifero, um, which is the middle name of Booker T. Washington um, so Booker Talifair Washington, also known as Booker T. Washington, my third great-grandfather and him were half-brothers. And then the name Talifair goes all the way back to the first families of Virginia. So I have a lot of European ancestry in me. I'm related to uh, John Adams and John Quincy Adams through their great-great-grandfather Henry Adams. I'm also connected to Thomas Rogers. So my entire half of my European roots are all throughout old New England and old colonial America, but I'm still considered to be black because of the color of my skin and the fact that I have black relatives and the fact that both my parents are mixed black. So this whole you know notion of of blackness is based upon whether you have one black ancestor um or not. Um, it's an unfortunate um, circumstance that um, has befallen the human race. But I think when we think about Titanic, we have to not think of Titanic in purely racial and racial terms as far as who was allowed to go on and who wasn't allowed to not go on the Titanic, but we have to also talk about the fact that where did these perceptions come from? They come from that society and they come from that world and it was extremely segregated and it was extremely racist and it was very violently racist, racist, especially in the United States and in South Africa and all around the world. 
uh, really, the Western world uh, for people of color. Uh, but to sum up the video, because I've been talking for 20 minutes, um, passengers on the Titanic were not prohibited from being passengers based upon um, their race, their color, or their creed. So I hope this video explains it. I think I just rambled on for the last 20 minutes. Um, if it doesn't explain it, then I'll probably remake this video again. All right.